Hi everyone, my name is Michael Frazis. I thought today I'd just do something slightly different, slightly different format, and just go through a few charts that I think are kind of interesting. Some companies we're looking at, some things we've added to, some things that haven't gone so well as well. As always, please send through any questions and I'll answer them um, as best I can. Okay, back to the beginning. So this is us. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these slides. I thought I'd just go through a few things because it's been a pretty challenging time for growth, uh, certainly for our strategy. We're positive for the year. There's plenty of funds in our space that are down, like Kathy Wood. But I thought I'd give some example of, of what happened and what's happened and, and why we're still so optimistic. So this company's Mercado Libra, which we've talked about many times. We bought this company kind of in the 400s early last year, uh, and it's gone up about three to four times. If you see, checking the, in with them multiple, you can see that it's gone from, you know, seven and a half, eight times, all the way, it basically doubled to the beginning of the year and then contracted again. Throughout that time, revenue, which is basically this light blue line, was increasing the entire time. So this company's maintained triple digit growth, but as of today, as with this chart, it's still well below, you know, its highs. So it's 25, 30% down. Now, what happens next? Well, in the past, this has proved very um, opportunistic levels to buy. And that growth, you know, effectively it's gone side, the stock has gone sideways for a year. The company has dramatically increased, you know, its revenues by almost twice as we move into October, November. So at some point, it's kind of like loading a spring. At some point that fundamental growth will come through and you won't just get back the 20 or 30% that the stock is down from its highs, you'll get significantly greater value, value appreciation. Another interesting quote I came, or interesting quote I came across uh, recently was that most, like the most interesting outcomes are always at the extremes of the distributions, particularly in, in life, particularly in investments, and particularly when today's world is going, is moving super fast. So the fact that you can invest in something and hold it for five years, many of these companies will be in materially different positions and be worth a huge amount. Now, the only way we know how to capture that value accretion is to basically basically be in them throughout the entire time. Another interesting company is Kupang. So this is like the market leader in South Korea. So it came on at 50. It's now almost halved. We were, we kind of bought around 35 and, and we added a lot in the last few days, kind of in the, in the mid, to high, mid to high 20s. So you can see using the multiples. And again, I'm just using revenue because it's an easy, honest thing and it's consistent throughout each company through time. You can see the multiple contract from three and a half to almost almost one and a half, but not quite. So the multiple is roughly halved over a period where the company's done exceptionally well. They've done something like 15 quarters of 50% plus organic growth. Uh, in many ways, it's one of the more interesting e-commerce companies actually. They're very good at delivery. So you can order things in the evening and it'll arrive in the morning. Um, you can eat, I don't know, to make sandwiches, take kid before you send your kid to school. You can order the bread and ingredients and it'll be there. They're also very good with returns. So if you want to return something, you can just leave it outside your door. And that is a compelling, and I'm sure eventually we'll get that here as well. It's a very compelling offering. So we think this is one of those periods where a company's IPO'd, it's then sold off significantly. We know that SoftBank is selling, for example, I mean, pretty serious size. But if you fast forward three, four, five years and the company continues to compound, you know, you're already at, you know, those valuation lows. You're already at a sustainable valuation level. So there's a good chance that the multiple stays the same or even increases and your return will be the organic growth plus whatever that increases in multiple. Another company that we invested in was Opendoor. So Opendoor is basically, it's in the United States. It offers people the ability to effectively immediately sell their home. So you'll say you want to sell your home to Opendoor. They'll use their algorithm to give you a rough price. They will inspect, inspect it outside and they will ask you to potentially go through with the iPhone and and, uh, and camera and, and video the place. But broadly within 24 to 48 hours, they'll give you a cash offer. And they'll charge a fee to do that. At the moment, it's about 5%. But that compares very favorably to the United States Real Estate Commissions, where there's basically two sides as well. There's buyer's agents and seller's agents. And obviously, the real issue with selling a home is time and, and, and settlement dates and also that uncertainty. So the fact that there's a willing buyer that's there to just kind of buy... Um, happily buy houses, uh, not quite sight unseen, but close to sight unseen immediately is extremely attractive consumer offering. 
Um, and this company has grown exceptionally fast, grew 60% over the last three months. And the multiple again, and again, it's hard to use multiples here, but the multiple contracted from four times, which clearly needs some level of contraction to a bit over one times. And this is a business that should probably be able to eke out, you know, 10% margins. So that multiple now is sustainable. There's almost like a, there's a few holdouts in business in terms of uh, the hand, there's a handful of industries that were resistant to e-commerce. E-commerce has revolutionized uh, most, most of retail, but the, the, the kind of holdouts, uh, luxury fashion, autos and, and, and real estate. Think about luxury fashion, you know, we did pretty well out of Farfetch, but that is basically half from its highs and we're out. We, we rotated entirely into Seta, it's a company growing at 300% plus, which is up sevenfold from IPO where we participated in. And then Carvana has gone from 5 billion to 50 billion. So everyone's eyes are wide open to, you know, those, those parts of the economy, the parts of retail that were seen as impossible to put on the internet probably will eventually be revolutionized. So all kinds of people, all kinds of businesses are jumping up trying to declare themselves the Carvana of X or Y. But we think Open Door can actually do it. Um, one of the similarities is if they can make the business work on their 5% fee, They'll be able to charge ancillary rev revenues, you know, for mortgages, for title and escrow. Uh, they'll just be able to like add in services and generate revenue that way. And that will be a key part of the value proposition as well. It's also similar to Carvana in the sense the market's just enormous. So auto is, you know, over a trillion dollars in the US. It's the biggest sector um, other than, it's bigger than luxury fashion. The only thing bigger than it is, is, is real estate where people spend 10, 15, 20 years of earnings to buy a home to live in. And so the market opportunity is huge. You could, you could reduce that market opportunity and say, what is, it could roughly equivalent to say the real estate commissions, but even that's like kind of 95, hundred billion a year of real estate commissions. That's another pretty significant part of the market that they can go for. Now, Australian investors are very familiar with Zillow because the fund here took like a 50% position in it just roughly and got a lot of local investors in. So Zillow was doing the same thing. So Zillow is kind of like the realestate.com.au from a consumer's perspective. You go on, you look at houses, you browse around, it gives you a Zestimate, um, lots of fun. You can see what your house is roughly worth. Now Zillow tried to go into Open Door's model and do these instant homes, basically, apparently after Rich Barton, the founder had, had read um, Ben Thompson's Strategy note, which I highly recommend. If you want a good blog, Strategy by Ben Thompson is excellent. But the problem was, is they're completely different businesses. So Zillow, it goes for effectively advertisers to state agents and a state agent model. It's much smaller market than realestate.com.au. Putting aside the difference between Australia and the United States, in realestate.com.au, you pay to advertise to everybody. In the US, you're basically trying to get estate agents advertising to clients to get them. So it's, it's a smaller, smaller pool. But I do have these estimates. So you can see why I thought, why don't we do these instant offices, offers and, and try and copy Open Door's model. But they've just, about a week ago, they suspended their iBuy. So it turns out those estimates weren't good enough. They weren't able to clear their stock profitably um, and they've paused that. Now there's no guarantees in this model. There were two things that I always thought were, was why I was previously skeptical about it. The first was that you're always holding inventory. So when the market turns, you're going to be stuck with a bag of real estate always. Now this happened just by the just by the definition of just by the nature of your business model. It's actually happened last year. We got to see what would happen. So immediately open door like stopped buying homes and then just cleared the inventory. And then when the market turned, they have to come back bigger, better, and stronger. So it is more robust than you might think at first. Second part was that there's a bit of game theory going on. So let's say you own a home and you know it, like you know the area, you know if it's the nice side of the street, you know if it's in that, you know where the sunlight is, you know things that are very obvious to people in the area. Um, you also know the condition that you've left it in uh, and the deep condition, you know, how many of those little things are wrong and how many things need to be fixed. So let's say you get given an offer. If the offer is better than what you think you can get, you'll always take it. If it's worse, you won't. So where that potentially leaves one of these eye buyers in a situation where they're only buying the homes that are worse than they look, worse than the, the algorithms would suggest. And they're never buying um, the ones that are, that are higher. So that's kind of, I imagine that's probably what went wrong with Zillow. They would have been offering people prices if the people who knew most about their home thought it was too low and they could get better in the market, they went to market. If not, they gave it to Zillow and Zillow was stuck with inventory 
they struggled um, to achieve. Good thing about Open Door is it's all they do. Like this is the only thing they do. So Zillow is fundamentally an internet business first and foremost, and traditionally and culture-wise, and and you know very high revenue per employee, generally very high gross margins. Open Door is different. You know, it's they're going to live and buy by the success of their algorithms. Then it's a it's a low margin business. They're going to have to operate entire business in a way that that reflects that reality. And so it's not ultimately so surprising that the specialist has remained and is still buying houses, while somebody who was in an adjacent industry but not a specialist perhaps had the consumer relationship but didn't have the expertise in pricing and selling homes instantly. It's not so surprising that they did worse and have now exited. So this is now a pretty big position for us because it's already gone up a little bit. So it's about 6%, a bit over 6%. Another thing I thought was interesting was JFrog. So this is an exact, there's been a ton of IPOs and somebody just asked about um, Maketa, which I'll get to, but you know, this company came on at 35 times sales, uh, forward sales, share, share price above 80. Basically what they do is they do tools for developers. So they're in package management. So when you have a web application, you generally make use of packages, which are other programs that other people have made and you need someone to download and you need a way to download and manage those and make sure they're up to date make sure the new updates don't include security flaws. It's it's complicated part of development. And it, the, this is, the, this is the, the market leading industry tool. You can obviously do it for free, but this is the best industry tool. And they're trying now to use that position to go into adjacent areas. They see what's happened, it's gone from $80 to 35, kind of high 30s. So more than halved. And the multiple has gone from mid 30s, actually close to closer to 40 down to 10 times. So this is where we think there's opportunity now in, in software. So this is where we think the opportunity is in software because there's been this huge dispersion. I've got a slide here somewhere. There's been a huge dispersion in software between the fastest growing ones and the, and the slowest growing. So the fastest growing, you know, your snowflakes, your build.coms, they're trading at valuation highs, even with the rise in interest rates. Um, but 62 times sales, this is, this is from a guy called German Ball who's on Twitter, sends out these kinds of charts and email address if you're, to his mailing list if you're interested. You can see there's been a huge decline in kind of the, the median and then a massive increase in the, the top. Now we think that you, you're not gonna make money, I don't think, on, on buying 62 times sales for anything. You might do okay, particularly in the short term, because there's a ton of momentum in these things. But over five years, that multiple has to contract, you know, potentially 80%. Um, and this is another way of looking at it. So this divides, he also divided the software into buckets. So the fastest growing, the median, and the, the lower growing. And again, you can see the median is actually where there seems, and the lower growing software companies where there's been the most compression. And they're almost back down to where traditionally these were very good times to buy. But the high growth software has basically maintained that huge valuation uplift that it got earlier in the year. This is another company we've been looking at, so Chegg. So we don't own this, but we would, I'm thinking about it, thinking about it very carefully. So this is, they basically offer extremely good platform for the students, for university level students, often doing like math, science, engineering, difficult subjects. So lots of um, questions and answers, past exam papers with detailed answers, uh, that kind of thing. The kind of content that, that's very hard to create, very hard, difficult to build from scratch. Chegg has it. And all the interns we have absolutely love it and rave about it. So it's definitely got customer love. Growth is generally kind of 25 to 35%. So it's not crazy explosive growth, but it's still pretty solid. And the reason I think this is interesting now today is that the share price is obviously up over the last two years, down from its highs. I think it peaked around, um, I guess it was about 120 and is now down in the low 60s. But you can see the multiples come down from you know, 18 times to, to eight. So you're getting back to kind of the valuation ranges where historically returns were, were very good. And in fact, I thought I'd share a couple more points on this. That this was kind of a, a what was it, two year, three year chart? It's a five year chart. And so think about that, that, that software chart, the 62 times sales. This company was trading in low single digits and went all the way to 17 and a half times, but now it's trading at kind of eight times forward. Think about what happened to the share price. It went up 10 times in five years. So this is the profile you kind of want if you want to get that. Interestingly, you know, revenues have grown, but you know, we have companies that have grown revenues by this amount. I've actually got the numbers here, by from 254 to 800 mil. 
they have companies that have done that, you know, in a year. So it hasn't been revenue growth in this case that has done the performance. It's been these two times sales to 18 times, then to 10 times. It's so a 4x increase in EV sales and I guess two to three X in, in revenue. That's what gets you these profiles. But you don't see any of these charts of companies that you're buying at 60 times. We are looking at this very closely. Where's, where's the correct chart? Yeah, yeah, particularly if it gets around seven and a half times, then, then we'll certainly add this to our portfolio. Another one that's gone through a bit of a journey is Zoom. So obviously one of the, probably potentially the coronavirus stock, other than perhaps Moderna, traded all the way up to some crazy EV sales and then has basically halved since then. So growth is largely maintained. It's not like it's shrinking and it's very profitable. It's not like these, the vast bulk of these companies that are not yet at profitability. It's printing cash and will do so for the near future, but the multiple is really contracted contracted from well over 100 times to, you know, sub 25, about 20 times forward from memory. And that's interesting. It's interesting because there might be an opportunity there. One thing that piqued our interest always is the short interest. You can see these spikes in short interest generally preceded very dramatic uplift in price as the short sellers effectively had to close. So it's always good to come in after that selling has been done, but it's a challenge. I mean, we use team, we, I used Zoom religiously and now I use Teams. Like it's just, if you have to use Microsoft, and we have to use it because there's one or two tools like Bloomberg that don't really integrate with anything else. If you have to use it, the, the logic of using Teams is just very compelling. You know, first it's free. Secondly, it's just all in built in your Outlook. You can just press a button and then you can just call everybody you need to call. But Zoom is still, I would say, better. So untangling those two things, you know, most people seem to like Zoom more. Untangling those two, and, and also a lot of people don't use Microsoft. So I'm taking those two things and trying to figure out how the competition kind of plays out is not straightforward, but there's almost certainly a price at which this makes sense. And we're probably getting closer to it now. I thought it'd be interesting to check in in one of these old favorites. Uh, I was asked about Coinbase. I was actually gonna talk about this. So we have about a 5% position in this and we're buying it kind of the last few weeks. It's now rallied significantly. It looks like Facebook's gonna integrate with them for their own cryptocurrency plans. This is one of the cheapest, fastest growing companies on the market, hands down. In fact, all the listed, well, a number of the listed cryptocurrency equities are the fastest growing and cheapest companies, the cheapest, fast growing large companies. This did 3 billion of either dimes, trading at 64 billion. There's software companies that, that have a tenth of that in revenue and are trading at 65 billion. You know, this is the, this is the mismatch, this is the value mismatch. Um, and cryptocurrency is getting very real. There's, there's a, it's a weird moment for cryptocurrency. So on the one hand, there's people that still think it's a Ponzi scheme and they're debating over that. On the other hand, there's a ton of people who just quit everything they're doing and just live in crypto world now and are building, you know, Web3, you know, the most exciting, you know, platforms and games and, and, and the most exciting things going on in the art world as well. And so it's becoming, meanwhile, basically every institution is realizing they need to have a part of this. Now, I know from, from our use, like we have to transfer and receive money all the time. People are investing in our fund, they're sending money out for placements. It's an absolute nightmare. Um, when you start transacting in crypto, the fact that you can just go check any transaction at any time, it's just so compelling. Um, and I'd say it's, it's revolutionized at least three industries. So the first industry is art. It's think about art over the last tens of thousands of years, the most valuable and best art often the artists themselves didn't get anything for it. These were people that lived in poverty and had horrible lives and had high rates of suicide and things like that. Um, they never got the recognition. And even if they did get the recognition later in life, they never got credit for their, or financial credit for their earlier work. You know, NFTs this is one of the first times that artists, and admittedly it's only in a, in a small part of the art world, um, but some artists are making a huge amount of money and uh, will, because of the nature of the, di the di digital asset, the fact that you can program it and put in all kinds of features, or future sales of the artwork, they'll also get a cut. So you think about the evolution of like what it's like to live as an artist. Now is probably the best time ever, because even if you sell an artwork, you can also sell the NFT that represents that. And, and effectively every time the artwork is sold, get a piece. It's something that musicians can also do. You know, they can sell an NFT of an album. Um, and again, you know, generate revenue for bands that, you know, it's one of those pretty little things, you know, a handful of people make all the money and a lot a large, large number of people struggle but make ends meet and then a lot of people don't make anything. Um, NFTs and, and crypto give people a way to kind of develop that 
has clearly revolutionized the art world. And that's just a fact. Um, whether you like it or not, you know, artists, a number of artists have made more money than they could have possibly made otherwise. Another part, another element that's been completely revolutionized is gaming. And it's interesting because you know, if you think about there's a lot of nascent crypto behavior before crypto. If you think about World of Warcraft, which was, you know, world, I never played it, but a world where you have a character, you build a character up, and the more you kind of do things, the stronger you get. You need to invest a lot of time to do it, to build your character up. So naturally, you know, in the third world, people uh, in places like China and, and other places, maybe third world's a bit of an outdated um, phrase, but, you know, in, in parts of, in low-income parts of the, of the world, people would set up farms where they basically just clicked and they just build up characters and sell them to the OS. It's very kind of crypto-like. So now if you add, now there's games like Axie Infinity, which have grown immensely fast, in some ways probably the fastest game growing game by absolute revenue dollars ever. But people can effectively build these characters out, sell them, battle them, grow them, all with this like native crypto overlay. And you think, okay, why do you need crypto for that if it was working for World of Warcraft? Well, it didn't. You know, you didn't have a wallet in World of Warcraft. In a crypto-based game, you just sign up and you have an instant wallet that can then transact, not just within the game, but outside the game with anybody that you might want to transact with. That doesn't exist. And to the extent you try and recreate that, you are talking about cryptocurrency. Because then you think, okay, well, what if you had these wallets interacted with other wallets and it's just conventional fiat currency? Well, if there's no level of trust, you're not going to be able to do that. And then it's, that's crypto and cryptocurrency, you do have that level of trust. So gaming and art from first principles have already been revolutionized. Third one's probably criminal behavior, which is one of where it started. But again, criminal behavior is massively overdone, I think. And there's good evidence for that. And the evidence I'll put forward for that is Bitcoin is actually really bad for criminals, you know, because it's pseudonymous. So if, if, if let's say Silk Road goes down, the founder's discovered, and he's got a Bitcoin wallet, you can see every single person who's transacted with that Bitcoin wallet. Uh, so if you bought drugs of somebody and they got caught, they could then trace um, you to your transaction to your wallet. And if you'd done anything, let's say you'd bought something online or you, it was a wallet associated with an exchange, you could then track you could immediately link it to you. So Bitcoin is terrible for crime. But there are some cryptocurrencies that are very good for that. Uh, and they include um, things like Monero, which are effectively untraceable. And so you'd think if crime was a bigger part of it, that those would be some of the biggest cryptocurrencies. Um, and this is actually what I expected to happen, but it didn't. The vast bulk of that 2 trillion plus of crypto wealth is not in those criminal asset, criminal cryptocurrencies. It's in the ones associated with gaming and kind of the base layer currencies of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So in any case, crypto is here to stay kind of whether you want it or, or not. It's already revolutionized three industries um, and that's only going to continue with Web3. But the idea is basically you can rewrite every single website to have inbuilt net crypto, firstly, in, in terms of funding the website. Secondly, in terms of the way that, you know, let's say YouTube, a YouTube equivalent would reward creators. There's a very natural way of doing that with cryptocurrency that rewards firstly the people that watch videos the most and the earliest secondly creators and thirdly people that just want to believe in the future of the platform and are happy to commit capital to it spotify you know trade desk advertising all these kinds of things there's certainly digital cryptocurrency ways of building those websites in, much, in potentially much more natural ways so anyway that was a few comments on why we're comfortable with cryptocurrency but we don't need to use that um, to invest in something like Coinbase because we can use our traditional metrics of customer love, explosive growth. I uh, also know that there's forecast declines in, um, in Coinbase. Already that's starting to decrease. So basically everyone think that this year is a one-off and there's going to be a huge fall next year. That's what's behind these declines. At the moment, Bitcoin is actually at new heights. So there's a chance that those declines are actually growth next year. Um, and that would cause, that would turn this from, I mean, it was a $50 billion company um, a couple of weeks ago to, you know, 100, 150, $200 billion company. They can maintain another year of growth. We think they probably can. The cool thing about blockchain is you can see revenues of everything. So if you, Axie Infinity is a game that, I'm not sure what time frame this is. I think this is over the last month. You can basically see all the revenue that's been transacted on a particular chain. Every transaction can be summed up. There's like full transparency. So it's very easy to see which ones are rising and falling. And Axie Infinity is a game that kind of like that World of Warcraft idea, people, it's, it's huge in the Philippines. Apparently in the Philippines, you can get two to three times the average income by
by playing Axie and building out these characters. It's fascinating. I think there's probably an opportunity to list some miners and somehow I seem to have put the charts in the wrong spot, but nevertheless, uh, this is a chart of Bitcoin price. So you can see there was a strong rally into the beginning of the year, a fall along with that we're all too familiar with. And then it's been one of the first of those growth speculative assets to reach new heights. But again, on the blockchain, everything's visible. So you can see the mining hash rate, which is kind of equivalent to the mining, I guess, supply. And you can see that hasn't reached new peaks. And the reason for that is China's made it, basically made it illegal to mine cryptocurrency. Now, I'm sure there's Chinese people and, and actually use cryptocurrency. There's, I'm sure there's plenty of Chinese people active in crypto market, but you, there's no way you can secretly have a huge mining farm um, taking up valuable electricity in the middle of China. Um, so that's one ex possible explanation for this disparity. The fact that Bitcoin has got to a new high, but the hash rate, um, which is how much the miners make, is has not. Now, it turns out there's some listed miners in the US and, and some Australian companies as well uh, that should be absolutely printing money now because Bitcoin has gone up. The hash rate, which defines the kind of cost to mine, has stayed down, um, which creates an opportunity. There's a number of those, those companies and they're all going through pretty extensive rollouts. So it'll be interesting for us to see what happens to this hash rate as those rollouts come in, as that new capacity comes on. So we would have, I personally thought it's already, some of it's already started coming on. So I thought you'd been able to see this in the chart by now, but you haven't. But that is something I'm going to watch very, very carefully. So I thought I'd answer some questions now. Marketa. Marketa is pretty good. Um, don't have a strong enough opinion. Last time I looked, it was like 20 times sales, growing strongly. Um, there's quite a recent IPO, it's off. I'd be interested to see if Marketa sells off further and do more work. A high quality company is just one of those ones where you're trading off growth versus valuation. And the sustainability of Coinbase. People seem pretty, I'd say crypto has been around for a while. There's that idea that the longer things have been around, the longer they will last. Extremely, like the, the longer people read a book, the more likely it is they'll read it long into the future. And I think kind of so many years in, it's, it's very much here to stay. And I'd say that the, the rare firms like Coinbase um, that existed and are very active in the space and have been and demonstrate market leadership, which Coinbase has, they'll always accrue extra assets, they'll always have a competitive advantage. So Bitcoin has a competitive advantage to the others because it's bigger, more liquid, and has been around longer. And some of those things you can't just change, you can't just create something new that has been around longer or has been tested so many times, hack, attempted to hack so many times. Similarly, Coinbase has been around the longest. So there'll be people that who will have a premium on um, the easiest, most reliable, safest place to store my cryptocurrency. You're going to use Coinbase, which leads to sustainability. I'm happy to send through those charts to answer that question. Shoot me an email at michael at frazzascapitalpartners.com. Thoughts on Australian bioscience at the moment. Has anything caught her eye? We own a few things. We own Imracor, which is said pretty heavily in a couple of IPOs. So EBR, which makes these cool little implantable devices in cool devices in a heart, like a pacemaker that can be charged externally. Um, that's coming to market soon. We've got quite a decent allocation to that. And we've also got this allocation to Radio Farm, uh, which is developing a number of different antibodies linked to radioisotopes. The interesting thing about radioisotopes is that there's two levels. So first you get an approved image, if the image is well, which means it's going to the right spot, binding to the right thing, then it's a good, very good chance. It's a good um, therapeutic. What you do is then crank up the dose. These things are radioactive. They kill things that are close to it. So you go from an imaging product, which is easy to test for and more likely to pass. And then if that works, you can then extend it to a much larger market which is therapeutics. Tilix is extremely successful in Australia doing that. Clarity Pharma, which focuses on copper isotopes has come to market and Radio Farm is using some really interesting antibodies. Maybe we'll go more into that one next time. Okay, we'll finish there. Let me know what you think of this format. Just going through a few slides and just letting you know what we're thinking about certain things at, at certain times. Thanks so much for, for logging in and, and listening in. Uh, look forward to doing the next one. Hope you all have a fantastic day.